I ask no person to believe in me. I prefer that people fear me. I am no beggar. I take what I want by cleverness and force. Begging people to believe is the business of my opposition. Not mine. Not mine. Not mine. Your Majesty will please pardon my rudeness, but I would not be able to look myself in the face again if I did not tell you, here and now, that you are the damnedest fiend ever to be turned loose on innocent people. I always had the wrong conception of you. I thought you were kind enough to let people alone while they were living, that you merely tortured their souls after death. Now I learn from your own brazen confession that you destroy their right to freedom of thought and cause them to go through a living hell on earth. And this is a correct description of what has basically happened to the narcissist. Um, the enemy has basically usurped the power of their mind and caused them to create for themselves a living hell, okay? So this is what um, the inner emotional and mental landscape of um, a narcissist actually looks and feels like once it has been, um, <clears throat> you know, taken over and is being controlled by the devil, okay? What do you have to say to that? I get what I want by exercising self-control. It is not so good for my own business, but I suggest you emulate me instead of criticizing me. So recognizing that the only source of true power um, in this realm is the power of the Most High that is being brought through you, which would be the conduit, okay, for that power. Um, the devil being very um, cunning and deceptive um, basically tricks you into using your own power against yourself. So it would be very wise for you to gain self-control so that you are not being controlled by the enemy. And we will be discussing as we go forward um, exactly how to do that, okay? You call yourself a thinker, and you are. Otherwise, you would never have forced this interview on me. But you will never be the sort of thinker that frightens me unless you gain and exercise greater control over your own emotion. Gain and exercise greater control over your own emotion. The reason why it's so important to gain control over your own emotions is because emotions um, represent the the very power that is used to um, push your creations from the uh, mental and emotional um, realms into the physical realm. So emotion, energy, in motion, your own energies. In motion is the exact power that is being used to create your reality okay and the way that to gain control over your emotion is to discipline the mind and gain control over your thought because when you uh, don't take control over your own thoughts and fail to discipline your mind um, it is easy for the enemy to take control over your thoughts and cause you to form habits such as smoking and other detrimental habits that uh, in turn gives the enemy even more control over even more space in your mind. Check this out. Well, a habit is a redundant set of automatic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through repetition. So the repetitive process um, through which these unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions have become habits is uh, through the law of hypnotic rhythm, which we discussed um, the other day. And there is a video on hypnotic rhythm on No Narc Network TV and Badass Conjure. Okay. The habit is when you've done, th done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it better than your mind. So if you think about it, people wake up in the morning, uh, they begin to think about their problems. Those problems are circuits of memories in the brain. Each one of those memories are connected to people and things at certain times and places. And if the brain is a record of the past, the moment they start their day, they're already thinking in the past. Each one of those memories has an emotion. Emotions are the end product of past experiences. So the moment they recall those memories of their problems, they all of a sudden feel unhappy, they feel sad, they feel pain. Now, how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So the person's entire state of being, when they start their day, is in the past. 
So what does that mean? The familiar past will sooner or later be predictable future. So the familiar past becomes the predictable future through the law of hypnotic rhythm. So let's relate this to people who have uh, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, most of those people have or were traumatized um, in their early childhood, at which point um, their development was arrested, okay? At which point they began to um, go through the process of recreating those same emotions by having the same thoughts, um, thereby um, operating fully under the law of hypnotic rhythm, okay? So, if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, and you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking. Well, when rational thinking um, gets overtaken by emotions, um, you have officially become a narcissist. By very definition of emotions, you're thinking in the past. And for the most part, you're going to keep creating the same life. Which explains why narcissists um, always do the same repetitive, destructive actions over and over again without any conscious thought. So the law of hypnotic rhythm is essentially being used against them to trap them in their own loop of negative thoughts, actions, and behaviors. So then people grab their cell phone. They check their WhatsApp, they check their text, they check their emails, they check Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, they tweet something, they do Instagram, uh, they check the news, and now they feel really connected to everything that's known in their life. And then they go through a series of routine behaviors. They get out of bed on the same side, they go to the toilet, they get a cup of coffee, they take a shower, they get dressed, they drive to work the same way, they do the same things, they see the same people, they push the same emotional buttons, and that becomes the routine and it becomes like a program. So now they've lost their free will to a program. So when it comes time to change, the re redundancy of that cycle becomes a subconscious program. So so this subconscious programming um, made possible by the law of hypnotic rhythm is um, what keeps the narcissist stuck in a repetitive cycle of negative thoughts, emotions, and behavior. 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a memorized set of behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious habits, hardwired attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions that function like a computer program. Let us get away from personalities. I came here to learn more about you, not to discuss myself. Please go ahead and tell me of the many tricks you have devised for gaining control of the human mind. What is your most powerful weapon just now? That is a difficult question to answer. I have so many devices for entering human minds and controlling them that it is difficult to say which are the most powerful. Right at the moment, I am trying to bring about another world war. My friends here in Washington are helping me to involve America in the war. If I can start the world to killing on a wholesale basis, I shall be able to put into operation my favorite device for mind control. It is what you call mass fear. So keep in mind, again, that this book was written in 1938. And um, so at the time, um, he was wanting to put these things into place. But think about now, fast forward into the future, um, mass fear has been put into place, okay? So think about, um, you know, the, the constant threats of wars, the wars that are actually are happening. Think about um, diseases like HIV, um, disease outbreaks like the H1N1, um, the Ebola, whatever diseases they want to come out to cause mass fear. Um, wars, again, um, events like 9-11, um, where there was so much death and there was so much um, anguish and fear involved. Um, again, not only by the people who perished in that um, that horrible event, but also the people who were forced to watch it either in person or on television, that it added so much um, negative energy in the form of mass fear um, to this demon that he was actually able to take form, okay? I used this device to bring about the other world war in 1914. I used it to bring about the economic depression in 1929. And if my opposition had not double-crossed me, I would now be in possession of every man, woman, and child in the world. You can see for yourself how near I came to world domination, the thing I have been struggling to attain for thousands of years. 
So guys, keep in mind the, the um, ultimate goal of the enemy is to um, possess 100% um, of your minds, okay? And um, he wants to possess every mind on the planet. Um, now we know that this is not going to happen, but at the same time, it is something to keep in mind when you come into contact and when you're dealing with um, their, his children, okay? Who are the people um, who have been um, diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder? the sociopaths and the psychopaths okay so when they are playing these mind games um, on you um, confusing you mentally and torturing you mentally and psychologically um, you know the, uh, the ultimate goal is to drive you mad okay so that um, their father the devil can move in and take full possession of your mind now the narcissist may or may not be aware of um you know the driving force behind their diabolical actions and behaviors whether or not they are aware of the fact that they are possessed um, does not negate the fact that the demon that is driving them as the host um, it has a goal of basically causing you to vacate your own mind so that he can move in and fully possess it. Okay? Yes, I see your point. Who wouldn't? You are a very ingenious manipulator of the minds of people. Is your devilish business carried on only through people of high position and great influence? Oh, no. I use the minds of people in all walks of life. As a matter of fact, I prefer the type of person who makes no pretense of thinking. I can manipulate that sort of person without difficulty. I could not control 98% of the people of the world if all people were skilled in thinking for themselves. I'm interested in the welfare of those people whom you claim to control. Therefore, I wish you to tell me all of the tricks by which you enter and control their minds. I want a complete confession from you, so begin with your cleverest trick. This is suicide you are forcing on me, but I am helpless. So settle down, and I will place in your hands the weapon by which millions of your fellow earthbound will defend themselves against me. Tell me first about your most clever trick, the one you use to ensnare the greatest number of people. If you force me to give away this secret, it will mean my loss of millions of people now living, and still greater numbers of millions as yet unborn. I beg of you... Permit me to pass this one question unanswered. So His Majesty the Devil fears a mere humble earthbound creature? Is that right? It is not right, but it is true. The reason why he fears you is because even though you're not aware of your power, he is. You have no right to rob me of my most necessary tool of trade. For millions of years I have dominated earthbound creatures through fear and ignorance. Now you come along and would destroy my use of these weapons by forcing me to tell how I use them. Do you not realize that you will break my grip on every person who heeds this confession you are forcing from me? Have you no mercy? Have you no sense of humor? Have you no sportsmanship? Stop stalling and start confessing. Who are you to ask mercy of one whom you would destroy if you could? Who are you to talk of sportsmanship and a sense of humor? You, who by your own confession have set up a living hell on earth where you punish innocent people through their fears and ignorance. Just like every narc you know. As for minding my own business, that is just what I'm doing when I force you to tell how you control people through their own minds. My business, if it can be called a business, is helping to unlock the doors of the self-made prisons in which men and women are confined because of the fears you have planted in their minds. My greatest weapon over human beings consists of two secret principles by which I gain control of their minds. I will speak first of the principle of habit, through which I silently enter the minds of people. By operating through this principle, I establish, I wish I could avoid using this word, the habit of drifting. Of drifting. Of drifting. When a person begins to drift on any subject, he is headed straight toward the gates of what you earthbound call hell. Describe all the ways in which you induce people to drift. Define the word and tell us exactly what you mean by it. I can best define the word drift by saying that people who think for themselves never drift. 
while those who do little or no thinking for themselves are those who do little or no thinking for themselves are those who do little or no thinking for themselves are drifters so basically all you need to do to keep the devil from possessing your mind is to use it stop being mentally lazy stop zoning out stop asking other people for answers that you can research and find the answers to yourself and use your mind to be creative if you stop being mentally lazy and are willing to do the work, then there is hope for you because... You can teach people through practice how to change their brainwaves, slow them down. And when they do that properly, they do enter the operating system where they can begin to make some really important changes. So um, most people then wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis. You know, they wait for loss, uh, some tragedy to make up their mind to change. And my message is why wait? And, and you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. I think right now, the cool thing is that people are waking up. The stronger the emotional reaction you have to some experience in your life, the higher the emotional quotient, the more you pay attention to the cause. And the moment the brain puts all of its attention on the cause, it takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. So long-term memories are created from very highly um, uh, emotional experiences. So what happens then is that people think neurologically within the circuitry of that experience, and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so when you have an emotional reaction to someone or something, most people think that they can't control their emotional reaction. Well, it turns out if you allow that emotional reaction, it's called a refractory period, to last for hours or days, that's called the mood. I say to someone, hey, well, what's up? You say, I'm in a mood. Well, why are you in a mood? Well, I had this thing happen to me five days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. If you keep that same emotional reaction going on for weeks or months, that's called temperament. Why is he so bitter? I don't know. Let's ask him. Why is he so bitter? Why are you bitter? Well. I had this thing happen to me nine months ago. And if you keep that same emotional reaction going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And so learning how to shorten your refractory period of emotional reactions is really where the, where the work starts. So then people, when they have an event, what they do is they keep recalling the event because the, the emotions of stress hormones, the survival emotions, are saying pay attention to what happened because you want to be prepared if it happens again. Turns out most people spend 70% of their life living in survival and living in stress, so they're, they're always anticipating the worst case scenario based on a past experience, and they're literally out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, they're selecting the worst possible outcome and they're beginning to emotionally embrace it with fear and they're conditioning their body into a state of fear. Do that enough times, body has a panic attack without you. you. You can't even predict it because it's programmed subconsciously. So then you say to the person, why are you this way? And they'll say, I am this way because of this event that happened to me. So most narcissists um, did have arrested development in childhood due to some traumatic event or a series of traumatic events at which point they got stuck in the loop of hypnotic rhythm. 15 or 20 years ago. And what that means from a biological standpoint is that they haven't been able to change since that event. So then the emotions from the experience tend to give the body and the brain a rush of energy. So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits and sending the same emotional signature to the body. Well, what's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is the unconscious mind. It doesn't know the difference between the experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. 
So the fact that your mind um, can't tell the difference between um, an emotion and a thought that's creating the emotion um, is the reason why the devil is able to um, use delusions, whether it's something that's real or not, in order to um, cause a reaction of fear within you, okay? Because the mind doesn't know the difference. And so if, if um, someone can make you believe something that's not real, um, you're, you're physiologically, you will still respond as if it is okay so the body's believing it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year and so then when those emotions influence certain thoughts and they do and then those thoughts create the same emotions and those same emotions influence the same thoughts now the entire person's uh, state of being is in the past so then the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before, period. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. The bigger thing is that we, we keep firing and wiring those circuits, they become more hardwired. So there, you have a thought and then the program runs. But it's the emotion that follows the thought. If you have a, if you have a fearful thought, you're going to feel anxiety. The moment you feel anxiety, your brain's checking in with your body and saying, yeah, you're pretty anxious. So then you start thinking more corresponding thoughts equal to how you feel. Well, the redundancy of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind. So now, when it comes time to change, a person steps into that river of change and they make a different choice and all of a sudden, they don't, they, they, they don't feel the same way. So the body says, well, you've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, all, you're you're going to just stop feel, suffering and stop feeling guilty and stop feeling shameful. And you're not going to complain or blame or make excuses or feel sorry for yourself. Well, <laughs> the body's in the unknown. So the body says, I want to return back to familiar ter territory. So the body starts influencing the mind. And it says, start tomorrow. You're too much like your mother. You'll never change. This isn't going to work for you. This doesn't feel right. Uh, and so if you respond to that thought as if it's true, that same thought will lead to the same choice, which will lead to the same behavior, which will create the same experience, which will produce the same emotion. And this is the law of hypnotic rhythm in action. If you're sitting down and you start thinking about uh, some future worst case scenario that you're conjuring up in your mind or that the devil has planted in your mind and you begin to feel the emotion of that event your body doesn't know the difference between the event that's taking place in your world outer world and what you're creating by emotion or thought alone so most people then they're they're constantly reaffirming their emotional states so when it comes time to give up that emotion, they can say, I really want to do it. But really, the body is stronger than the mind because it's been conditioned that way. So the servant now has become the master. So when he talks about the body being um, running on autopilot, essentially, he um, basically what has happened is that the seeds of negativity that were planted by the devil um, have been nurtured um, and been given energy by you long enough that now um, you're just automatically acting upon those thoughts as if they are real. OK, and when he speaks of the servant becoming the master, basically the body which was meant to serve your mind is now stuck in the loop of hypnotic rhythm and thereby just acting on autopilot. And the person all of a sudden, once they step into that unknown, they'd rather feel guilt and suffering because at least they can predict it. Being the unknown is a scary place for most people because the unknown is uncertain. And people say to me, well, I can't predict my future. I'm in the unknown, and I always say the best way to predict your future is to create it. So if you use your imagination to visualize yourself in the future as the you that you would like to be, your brain will be firing in so many different areas that the devil won't have any darkness in which to hide. Now, your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. And if you keep doing it, priming it that way, the hardware becomes a software program. And who knows? You just may start acting like a happy person. And then I think the, the hardest part is to teach our body emotionally what the future will feel like ahead of the actual experience. 
So again, this is where um, visualization during your meditations come in, okay? So if you um, can keep your mind focused on the reality that you would like to create for yourself in the future, and if you do this long enough, you will begin to have an emotional and physiological reaction as if this is really real already, and um, thus you have planted new seeds for a new reality for yourself going forward. Quantum model of reality is, is about causing an effect. The moment you start feeling abundant and worthy, you are generating wealth. The moment you're empowered and feel it, you're beginning to step towards your success. The moment you start feeling whole, your healing begins. And when you love yourself and you love all of life, you'll create an equal. Now you're causing an effect. When you love yourself and you love all of life, you'll create an equal. Now you're causing an effect. And I think that's the, the difference between living as a victim in your world saying, I am this way because of this person or that thing or this experience. They made me think and feel this way. When you switch that around, you become a creator of your world and you start saying, my thinking and my feeling is changing an outcome in my life. And now that's a whole different game. And we start believing more that we're creators of reality. Going from being a victim of reality to being a creator of reality requires mental discipline. If you can sit your body down and tell it to stay like an animal, stay right here, I'm gonna feed you when we're done, you can get up and check your emails, you can do all your texts, but right now, you're gonna sit there and obey me. So then, when you do that properly, and the, you're not eating anything, or smelling anything, or tasting anything, you're not up experiencing and feeling anything, you would have to agree with me that you're being defined by a thought, right? So when the body wants to go back to its emotional past, and you become aware that your attention is on that emotion, and where you place your attention is where you place your energy, you're siphoning your energy out of the present moment into the past. And you become aware of that, and you settle your body back down in the present moment because it's saying, well, it's 8 o'clock. You normally get upset because you're in traffic around this time. And here you are sitting and we're used to feeling anger and you're off schedule. Oh, it's 11 o'clock and you usually check your emails and judge everybody. Well, the body's looking for that, that predictable chemical state. Every time you become aware that you're doing that and your body is craving those emotions and you settle it back down into the present moment, you're telling the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind, and now your will is getting greater than the program. And if you keep doing this over and over again, over and over again, over and over again. Essentially rewiring the law of hypnotic rhythm to work in your favor. And the moment that happens, and the body's no longer the mind, when it finally surrenders, there's a liberation of energy. We go from particle to wave, from matter to energy, and we free ourselves from the chains of those emotions that keep us in the, in the familiar past. And we free ourselves from the chains of those emotions that keep us in the, in the familiar past. And we've seen this thousands of times. In fact, we can actually predict it now on a brain scan. Okay, so I'm going to leave you guys with that. And the No Narc Network members, do you do have a little bit of homework today? And that is just to answer the following questions in the group. And until we meet again, my people, keep it classy, keep it clean, and do what you got to do to make shit happen. Peace.